Chapter 3 The Tribe Now we know the family and uncle, but we have yet to learn about the tribe. The difficulty is just how many to introduce, because the tribe was rarely exactly the same two days running. It was Phil's term, and sometimes it included practically every family in the road, and one or two in the roads beyond. But most often it signified only the Graysons and themselves. I have not told you yet that they were the Howards. Master Phil Howard, Miss Howard and Miss Kitty Howard, their governess used to say when speaking of them to other people. Miss Sparks was so awesomely precise, they heard Dad say to Mother once. Well, when the Graysons joined in, there were three of them too, or four if you reckon they be. The collection was always known as the tribe. But sometimes there was deadly enmity, for half a day at least, between the two families. And then each became a separate tribe, prepared to fight the other to the death. And when, on the other hand, everybody joined in, as on birthdays and half-holidays, the term still held good. So it is not surprising that grown-up people, and others who did not know them very well, sometimes got rather mixed, and never knew quite how many were meant by the tribe. But the children themselves always understood, and so, strange to say, did Uncle Rupert from the very first and he was never known to make a mistake. The Graysons lived at a house called the Dovecot. It had a jolly garden, but there were no doves. We've got a cot, though, said Wally, when Phil poked fun at the name, and by this you might have known there was a baby in the family, though so far he scarcely counted. He did once, though, when they were playing Indians. It was a two-tribe affair, and the Howards were Mohicans, while the Graysons were Sioux. There was to be a surprise raid on the Sioux encampment, and Phil thought it would be nice. He was always the one who arranged these things. If the Grayson baby could be tied up in its blankets and suspended from a tree as a papoose, the baby was too sleepy to protest when they took him out of his pram. But by the time they had wound the clothesline round him and slung him on a tree so that he spun round and round like a joint on a jack, he became immensely interested and held his loudest, causing Mrs Grayson to hurry out in alarm. She was very angry about it, so after that, when they wanted a papoose, they always made do with the block the wood was chopped on, though everybody agreed the effect was not nearly so good. Well, of course the Graysons had heard a lot about Uncle Rupert, and so the two boys came round immediately after breakfast to see what he was like. It seemed hardly fair for one part of the tribe to have an uncle VC and not to share him with the rest. As nobody seemed to be about in the garden, Wally gave the customary signal by emitting three wheezy whistles, one lung, one short and another lung. These were supposed to represent the Morse code letter K and stood for come. Neither branch of the tribe seemed to be aware that the word is usually begun with a C and it would have made no difference if they had been because, as they frequently explained to each other mysteriously, they really used a secret cipher. Anyway, Somebody seemed to be sufficiently intelligent on hearing the whistles to know that somebody wanted somebody, for up went a window and a face lathered with shaving soap regarded them. Harold, the younger Grayson, who was rather a nervous boy, was for bolting like a rabbit. But Wally looked up stolidly and said, Please, we've come to see Uncle Rupert. Are you Uncle Rupert? Upon my word, I hardly know. Wait till I've washed the soap off my face and I'll look in the glass. But really, I didn't know I had so many nephews. I'm certainly better to be born lucky than rich. 
With that, the window went down and the two boys were left staring at each other. Their embarrassment was ended, or rather diverted, by a low and ominous growl from a branch above their heads. Glancing up, they were surprised, or as nearly surprised as any hardened member of the tribe could be, by the sight of Phil stretched at full length and glaring down at them, with what were evidently intended to be ferocious and glistening eyes. I'm a leopard, he whispered hoarsely. See my spots. Pointing to a series of clay daubs that disfigured his old surge knockabout, I'm going to spring. The two boys took their cue at once and jumped away. They were only just in time, with a wild hissing sound that would have done credit to the fiercest member of the cat tribe, Phil flung himself down. He missed the Grayson boys, he had thought it only fair to give them warning, but managed to collide with Joan, who had just come out the path after doing some shopping for Mother. Shocking. Shocking, altogether too shocking, came a laughing voice from the window. No leopard would jump like that. Phil was rather crestfallen, because he had thought his performance very realistic, and had planned to surprise most carefully, knowing the Graysons would come. How would he jump then? he asked. You told us last night. Ah, I dare say. But no words of mine could do justice to Mr Leopard's movements when he's looking for breakfast. And I'm afraid. I can't show you either. But I'll tell you what. I've a brainy idea. If Mother says yes, we'll go to... and see the leopard for ourselves. And your friends can come too if they like. I wish I could give you some idea of the expression on the tribe's face, or faces, when they caught the two missing words. Joan was the only one who could find her tongue, and even she was at a loss for a full minute. Oh, how splendid! A pause and a clap of the hands, and I can wear my new coat! The boys turned away in disgust. Wear her new coat. That such trifles should intrude in so solemn a moment. How awful girls were. No, their hearing had not tricked them. Uncle had really said the words. And he obviously meant them. And now, perhaps, we must venture to write them down in all their majestic significance. What he had said was, If Mother says yes, we'll go to the zoo. <laughs>